Can I have your attention, please? Uh, thank you very much. That was very polite. Everybody, you, congratulations. It was wonderful. Um, this is going to be a, um, get that down here. This is going to be a very good evening. Uh, and I'm Bob Wright. I'm chairman of the C and CEO of the Palm Beach Civic Association. That's coming in a little harsh, guys. Okay? Okay. Um, and tonight we're very proud um, to have this and host this special event uh, for our, uh, and honoring our major corporate sponsor, the Scripps Research Institute in Scripps, Florida. Scripps is an internationally known, well-renowned, highly respected biomedical research organization. Its life-changing research goes on in California and right here in our own backyard in Jupiter. Scripps discoveries are impacting the world and dramatically improving our lives. When you go through this, as we go into this, I want you to think of the, I want you to think of what your, what your meeting is, the chemistry boys, globally. These are the chemistry boys. So it's a, it, it's a very, it's a very, very special connection. I also like to recognize, uh, Ed uh, Ricci, who's the chairman of Scripps uh, Florida Board. Ed, thank you. <laughs> this September, the Scripps Research Institute announced the appointment of biologist Stephen Kay as its new president. Dr. Kay served as dean at the University of Southern California. He's a graduate of the Universal, of University of Bristol in the uh, UK, and he's conducted his postdoctoral work at Rockefeller University. He was later appointed to the faculty at Rockefeller University, and then joined the University of Virginia, my, my law school organization, in 1992. In 1996, Dr. K moved to Scripps, where he rose to become professor in the Department of Cell Biology, chairman of the Department of Biochemistry, director of the Institute for Childhood and Neglected Diseases, and chairman of the Scripps Florida Steering Committee. In 2007, Dr. K joined the University of California, San Diego, where he was responsible for building large-scale academic programs. He has published more than 250 papers and was recently named by Thomas Thomson Reuters as a highly cited researcher. He was elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences in 2008 and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2009. Dr. K has, has founded several biotechnology companies. His work has been highlighted in Science Magazine's Breakthroughs of the Year in three separate occasions. We're very fortunate to have Dr. K with us this evening. And I'm going to ask him to come forward now and tell you about Scripps and its amazing work. He will also introduce the Scripps scientists and leaders who are here with him tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Kay. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. How are you all feeling this holiday season? Has, has the idea of um, being involved in a pioneering moonshot come across your mind lately? Because tonight, this is what it's about. Tonight, we're going to really be telling you about how there is going to be this unique opportunity to capitalize on what has happened right here in Palm Beach County over the last 10 years and turn the foresight of the people into, of Florida the people of Palm Beach, turn that foresight into something that the whole world is going to look at and point to and say, we should have thought of that. And it happened right here in this town. So I want to tell you that you are an incredibly good looking crowd. And you're obviously also smart. Because you have helped support this kind of effort. So give yourself a huge round of applause for having the guts to come here tonight to listen to some science, and to have the courage to participate in something that's going to change the world. Give yourselves a good round of applause. <laughs> yeah. 
Now for me, this is a little bit of a homecoming because back in 2003, I was sitting in my office in California and I got a call from this funny little guy called Richard Lerner. And I think many of you know Richard and he's dear to you. And Richard said, I need you to come over to my office right now. There's someone I need you to meet. So I went over to the office. He was the president. Um, and there, sitting in his office, was someone who I recognized immediately, and it was Governor Jeb Bush. And the governor looked at me and said, you could be the right person, but you've got to lose that accent. <laughs> and I said, the right person for what? And he said, this is a time in which we can begin to transform the Florida economy. And I'm convinced that we should do that by beginning to invest in a knowledge economy and by beginning to invest in an academic hub that ultimately, over time, is going to catalyze all kinds of things for this state in terms of shifting it to a knowledge economy. And I looked at Governor Bush, and I said, you're not kidding? Because for a scientist, this is an incredible, life-changing opportunity. To be sitting with somebody who has played such a major role in the national political scene, who understood that resources that were going to come as a one-time bonus to the state could be deployed in a very different way than most states were deploying them. Somebody who had this vision, this to me was exciting. This to me was the first stage of the moonshot. And so we committed at Scripps. We committed to this state. We committed to these people. And with the amazing leadership here in the county of, of people like Karen Marcus, who's sitting there in the audience, who was at that time head of the county commissioners, um, and many, many other people who were involved in this project, you, the people of Palm Beach and the people of Florida, built something very, very special. You allowed a new type of research operation to be created. Now, if I ask you the question, what is Scripps? Raise your hand if you think you know what Scripps is. Right. So I need you to help solve a problem tonight. Because there is a big problem. You guys are like the Brits, OK? And I don't mean that as an insult. <laughs> You guys have created a crown jewel, but it's locked away right now in a closet. And this crown jewel that you've created is the start of a new type of paradigm for how discoveries are made. A new type of paradigm for how all of these amazing scientists who, can, who are sitting in front of you, and believe me, most of them only own one suit, OK? <laughs> All of these amazing scientists who are sitting in front of you, OK, you know what their job is? Their job is to come into work every day and to see something new in Mother Nature that nobody else in the world has ever seen before, OK? In the case of, of Joe Kissel, his shiny, lovely head right here, OK? Joe wants to discover what's going on in a cancer cell, OK? And he's discovering amazing new things about cancer. He's looking inside of cancer cells and turning on its head the kind of um, wrong ideas that some people have had about how we approach certain types of cancers. Proteins that were thought to be the brakes are actually the gas pedal, and vice versa. He's changing our view on it. We have neuroscientists here, real live brain doctors, OK? Although I would not let them operate on you. <laughs> but these people are leading the way in finding new paradigms for some of the most complex types of diseases that we need to solve. Um, this is a, a very genuine question with no humor associated. But how many of you in your lives have been touched by a neurodegenerative disease in a loved one like Alzheimer's? Keep your hands up. How many of you have been touched by a neurodegenerative de disease like Parkinson's? And how about neuropsychiatric disorders? Mine, I have a nine-year-old son who has autism. So members of our neuroscience department, and that would be their chairman here, Ron, Ron, wave. OK, it would be Courtney Miller, Gavin Rumbau, Damon Page. These scientists 
okay, at Scripps have the job of coming in and understanding the fundamental nature of brain function, the incredible complexity of brain function, and then turning that into new cures for intractable, what are currently intractable diseases. That's their job. That's what Scripps and the brand of Scripps is really all about. Now, how many of you in this audience feel like maybe you're beginning to get on in years a little bit? It's not many of you, because you're a very young and good-looking <laughs> crowd. But you know, right, that we're going to be facing a massive shift in society. The person who is going to live for the first time to 150 years has already been born. Okay, longevity is going to become a reality for us. And so diseases of aging and understanding how we age, both in terms of healthy aging and in terms of how we have to look at diseases that are associated with an aging population, is another highly complex challenge that the people of Florida who have supported the establishment of Scripps Florida actually see results coming. So with us tonight, we have scientists such as Roy, Roy Smith, who's chairman of the department, Laura Niederhofer, and Paul Robbins. And Laura, you'll see, is also a champion of science in general. You'll see her writing um, all kinds of advocacy articles for the scientific enterprise. These three amazing young scientists okay, are really at the bleeding edge of understanding what is it to age. How does aging impact our bodies, both in terms of being a healthy individual and in terms of the diseases that are going to be associated with an aging population? These are not simple problems to solve. These people don't come to work every day thinking about how can I just get the low-hanging fruit. They come to work every day thinking, I am at Scripps Research Institute of Florida. My job is to do battle with Mother Nature. And after I've done battle with Mother Nature, my job is to produce public benefit, to impact patient care. Now, there's also other ways to approach this. Pat Griffin over here, you can see Pat. He is one of the pioneers of Scripps Florida. He was one of the very first people who voted with his feet. And we were able to steal him away from the biotech and pharmaceutical world. Pat was very well known in that world. He had worked for Merck Pharmaceuticals for many years and had been doing his own biotechnology company. And Pat is interested in a number of very innovative ways of approaching diseases. And his work has, has very positively impacted, for example, osteoporosis. So, you know, I'm sure that there are people in the audience who are aware of this condition. It's something that impacts your life. So Pat's work, this amazing discovery that he does, we should really be called the Scripps Discovery Institute, because that's what all of these women and men do. His work is impacting our understanding of our immune system and how modulating our immune system can be used to treat autoimmune disorders, diseases like osteoporosis, or even cancer. Laura Bone down over here, Laura Bond, she's just an amazing leader in her field. How many of you are familiar with the challenges of chronic pain, of sciatica, back trouble, these kind of inflammatory um, neuropathies? And how well does ibuprofen work for you? Not very well at all. And how scary are some of the narc narcotic pain treatments that are out there? Laura wants to solve that for the world, okay? She's very passionate, and part of her, re her research is understanding these lock and key mechanisms that occur in the body, these receptors, that's a bit of a complex word, but these baseball myths that live on the outside of cells. And she's really interested in understanding how can we find the right ones that are gonna unlock the key to establishing new types of pain medicines that don't put you at risk for addiction and have much reduced side effects. They, you may not see their spurs, you may not see their boots, you may not see their wagons, but these young men and women are absolute pioneers in the same way that Flagler was a pioneer when he first came down into this community in the 19th century. Over on the far left here, we have a man from north of the border, Derek Duckett, and his colleague, Bill Rausch, you guys can, can, can wave. 
these guys are pioneering new kinds of cancer treatments, okay, uh, along with Joe here, um, and they're part of our cancer biology effort. Bill is a world-famous chemist. Derek is a world-famous molecular pharmacologist and biochemist. And they've collaborated, and this was in the news recently, and in fact, it, it was a paper, Derek, did it just come out today, guys? So they published a paper in, in, in the Vogue magazine of science, okay? It's called Science Translational Medicine, but just think of it as the Vogue magazine of science. They told the world this morning about a brand new type of chemical compound, a potential new drug, that's going to address a whole set of cancers. In some case, up to 33% of some cancer types carry this new target that could be positively affected by the work that these young men and women are doing, um, two men actually in this case. And um, what they have done is to show that this compound could be particularly effective, for example, in breast cancer. And if you're like me, there's going to be many members of your family or friends who've been touched by that disease. And, and these guys and their whole team are incredibly passionate about innovating and un unlocking those cures. And, and next to um, Derek is, is um, Patsy McDonald. And Patsy actually um, has also a long and storied history of being an innovator in drug discovery. She's an expert on another type of baseball mitt that catches chemical signals. And she recently teamed up with the almighty Dr. Lerner. And they had an amazing publication that really showed that using these amazing, brilliant ideas on how they can modify the way that these baseball mitts catch signals, that they think they can really develop a new treatment for diabetes. And diabetes, of course, is almost the scourge of the planet. As our planet changes its dietary habits across the world, diabetes is, of course, now becoming that new type of epidemic. So after I've said that, how do you feel now about what you know about Scripps? Raise your hand if you feel you know what Scripps is a little bit more. And give them a round of applause. They're amazing. <laughs> Scripps Research Institute is really Scripps Discovery Institute. It's where cures begin. It's where the people of Florida have invested in a paradigm that the world actually wants to copy. How many of you spend some time in New York City from time to time? I'm shocked. <laughs> so if you go to New York City, I used to live on York Avenue and 63rd Street. Have any of you lived near that neighborhood? I was in a subsidized apartment, by the way. <laughs> it wasn't my own. And I used to look out on Roosevelt Island. You guys know Roosevelt Island? Right, and what's happening on Roosevelt Island right now? Yeah, exactly, Cornell Tech. And Cornell is building an enterprise that, I don't know, sounds vaguely familiar to me. This enterprise is they say that scientists need to be mixing with people from pharmaceutical companies and academic institutions. Hmm. That scientists need the modern tools of drug discovery companies and pharma companies Hmm. That scientists need to be in new types of environments where they can mix across a very wide range of topics so that Gavin and Courtney can be working with chemists like Bill and without even thinking about it. Man, I just don't, that sounds familiar. Because you know what you guys did when you accepted scripts into your community? You beat Bloomberg and New York City, not by one, not by two, not by three, you were ahead of them by 10 years. Give yourself a round of applause for that. So what these other institutions are saying they want to build, what they're saying that they want to open and to see here in a few years has already been achieved and validated at Scripps Florida and with their interactions with their, with their colleagues in Scripps, California. So what I'm here to tell you tonight is that the Scripps discovery ecosystem, 
okay, that's what Scripts is about, is now ready for the next phase. We've already demonstrated that you can take young men and women and bet on them and set them free in an amazing environment where they can mix together, where they can converge, where they can bump, where they can enjoy a community that they enjoy in Palm Beach Gardens. They don't have to worry about the schools their kids go to. Um, it's not like in Southern California where it takes me four hours to get to work every day. Um, and that's with a helicopter. Um, I think that what you have done here is, is create a very special environment for discovery to occur. And now what I want to tell you tonight, under the new leadership of Scripps Research Institute, which is not just me, but it's, it's, it's our new CEO, Peter Schultz, who has a long and storied history in basic science and in translational science, we're ready now to do something that nobody else has done. We're ready for the second stage of the moonshot. Now, you're the people who built the Saturn V rocket. So I know that you're up for this. And you're the people who made a bet ahead, 10 years ahead, of New Yorkers and, and the amazing generosity of Mayor Bloomberg. You've got to give it to that guy. That is, that is generosity. Um, what we're ready to do now is to take control of the assets that these guys generate, of these early stage discoveries and drug candidates, and to take control of putting them into the clinic ourselves. And to actually say that we don't need to take a, a drug that Pat discovers or a drug that Derek and Bill discover or Laura here and license it for a very small fee to a drug company and have that drug company develop it. What we can do at Scripps, because we're well known for our entrepreneurism, we're well known for the deep quality of our scientists, what we can do at Scripps is raise a philanthropic fund that will support clinical development of our own discoveries that are made right here in Florida and in our sister campus in California. And what we will do if we will change that will mean that the next time Pat discovers it, a drug, we won't be licensing it for a million dollar upfront payment which comes back into our academic programs. If we raise this fund, we'll be able to spend $10 million on a clinical trial, and if that clinical trial is successful, we will license out Pat's drug candidate for $400 million up front, for 12 or 14% royalty streams. And what this will do is it will allow us to do two key things. This is what the moonshot is. This is what the new leadership of Scripps wants to achieve and build on the work that's been done right here in Palm Beach County and in La Jolla, California. What we'll achieve if we do this is not only will we be able to generate income back to the Institute that will evergreen that fund. That means that fund will be sustainable for many, many years down the road. So a gift will become a gift that truly keeps on giving. So that's one thing that will happen. The second thing that will happen is we will serve mankind in a way that all of these scientists have always hoped they'd be able to do. They love their discovery. They love discovering new things. But all of them also have the integrity, okay, the wish to really contribute something to mankind. They want to see that they can make a difference that goes beyond the people they train and the papers that they publish and leaves a lasting effect in terms of new types of patient care. So we're going to be able to serve mankind and to give back to society, and we're going to be able to generate a new kind of model for how discovery institutes like Scripps can be sustained. Why do we need a new model to sustain these kind of institutes? Do you have any idea? What was the way in which these institutes have been traditionally supported? By the federal government. Can I ask you a simple question? How many of you guys trust the federal government with your future? <laughs> to some degree, varying degrees. Um, as I said, Laura here is a, is a real champion for science. She participates a lot on the Hill in terms of making the case for why science is important. 
There might be some glimmers of good news coming, thanks to the kind of work that Laura personally did um, in terms of the NIH budget. But it's really not going to change, in my view, the overall picture. The NIH budget and its spending power is 22% less than it was 10 years ago when we founded Scripps Florida. And what these young men and women have done is they have not only created a world-class research institute, they've not only spun out by tech companies, they've not only created value for the institution as a whole, they've done it during one of the most crippling recessions in this nation's economic history, and they've done it during a time when the NIH budget has been decreasing. But we're really at the end of our tether, if you like, in terms of how we can sustain that type of research institute. The NIH will always be a part of what we do, and we are incredibly grateful. We don't take these tax dollars for granted. People like yourselves go out and work hard, really hard, and you pay your taxes, and some of that comes back and funds these innovators that you see before you and the amazing things that they want to return to society. So this is why we need a new model. We need a new model that will involve NIH dollars. We need a new model that will involve some of the amazing gifts that some of you have already made to our institute. But we need to be bold. This is the time to build that new Saturn V, the Saturn V of healthcare, the Saturn V that showed that America was this incredible leader, the Saturn V that brought the eyes of the world to Florida every time we shot one of those things up there. Okay, so the time really is now where there's a wonderful opportunity for discovery scientists, like the ones that you see in front of you, to take control of turning their discoveries into medicine. And that's what we intend to do at Scripps. So Scripps is all about discovery. It's a discovery institute. It figures out what happens inside of the human body when we're healthy. It figures out what happens inside of the human body when, we're, when we have a disease, and it comes up with the beginnings of cures. And so this is why it's so meaningful and, and a little bit emotional, quite honestly, for me to be back here as president of this amazing institute. My job is to serve these amazing men and women. My job is to support them, to enable them, to make sure that I do not build fences as their president, but I build runways. And that's what we're really here to do. And we can't do it on our own. They can think of the ideas. They can come up with the amazing new cures. They, they've done their job. They've gone and gotten $500 million in non-Florida funding for the research programs that they do. But if we're really going to take this to the next level, We've got to do the kind of bold venture philanthropy efforts that I've been talking about. So to summarize, Scripps is about a whole new way of delivering ultimately patient care. You have this gem in your community. I need your help to get the message out. We've got to open up this dusty old chest of our communication strategy, pull out these crown jewels which are ultimately these young men and women and their brilliance, and show it to the world. Show it initially to this community, and then show it to the world. So I really hope that you're going to be willing to help. I hope that you are going to make a little effort to help us understand how we can communicate what we do to you. I don't want to be walking around telling people I'm president of Scripps and have people come up to me and say, that's really nice, Steve. I didn't know you liked fish. <laughs> Okay, or that I didn't know you'd gone into journalism. <laughs> okay, Scripps is a complicated name because of the founders. And you know where Scripps Research Institute was started? In 1924, by an amazing woman, Ellen Browning Scripps. She had one singular idea. She felt that she would get better treatment from her doctors if her doctors were involved in research if her doctors were involved in discovery. So she started a metabolic clinic, that's the same topic that, that Roy and, and Laura and Paul here work on, to look at metabolic diseases in 1924. 
So it took almost 100 years for that incredible cluster to form in Torrey Pines, for this pioneering woman's vision to come to fruition. And now you have a chance to carry that torch here in Florida. So what I'd like to do is to open up the floor to questions. You can ask us about what is it we're doing in the Institute, if, if you've heard about neuroscience or cancer biology or, or different types of drug discoveries. Ask us a little more about what we are, where we want to go, and also, we're open to suggestions. We don't think we know how to do everything, so pipe up. Tell us about how we can engage your community. Tell us what will excite you in terms of supporting us so that tonight we make a pact, the next moonshot. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here. I can't thank you enough, and we're going to open up this to questions. Sir, I don't know if there's a roving microphone or not. Yeah. Oh, sorry, we'll get back to you. We'll go here first and then you, OK? Any discovery for the future financial gain itself is great. Do we patent? Uh, yeah, very effectively. And um, um, <laughs> I have in my notes here. Um, so um, since Scripps Research Institute was started, we filed 350 foreign and domestic patent applications. Um, these people are not just discoverers, they're innovators and they're business people. Next question. And I really don't want to ignore the gent at the back. Okay, hi, my name is Linda Vinh. I'm on the Governance Council for the Prevention of Developmental Disabilities. And I do see an empty chair here. Uh, have you considered including genetic research with what you do? Because, you know, we fight very hard to eliminate potential developmental disabilities. And yeah. that's a very important piece. Um, ladies and gentlemen, would one of you, Gavin, I think? Gavin? Yeah, let's uh, give you my mic. Professor Rumbaugh. That's, that's an excellent question. So. Um, one, over the last 10 years, so some of the technology gains have happened, we now know that genetic mutations cause a substantial portion of these developmental disorders. So we know the major gene candidates, and people like David and I are working very hard in our labs to understand how these genetic mutations affect their function. And we're actually trying to develop cures and, and, and modulators of these, of these genes. Yeah, yeah autism, yes. I, I, heard, uh, I heard you talk about all the chemical uh, growth. How about immune or autoimmune therapy? Did you get my question? Hear a little bit about autoimmune? Yeah. Okay. Because, you know, that's where it's at now. We're, we're out of chemical, the chemical role. How about getting into the autoimmune therapy? Thanks. All right. Professor Griffin will take that. Thank you for the question. Sure, in uh, collaboration with several scientists at Scripps Florida and also um, a clinical uh, scientists in La Jolla campus, uh, we've been working on a, a particular uh, MIT, a particular receptor uh, that's involved in controlling a subset of uh, immune cells in the body. And these cells will give us a precision way to control uh, the recognition of self proteins as foreign so we can overcome these autoimmune diseases and we've also been applying that uh, again in collaboration with uh, Scripps La Jolla looking at uh, the same process in transplantation so coming up with new ways to improve uh, graft acceptance and also to improve suppression of the autoimmune response without all the harmful side effects of the current therapies for things like type 1 diabetes, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, but also multiple sclerosis and a host of other diseases. 
Oh, so yeah, and Scripps uh, has had a long uh, interest in autoimmune diseases and one a close uh, friend of mine and collaborator, he Rosen at Scripps La Jolla, uh, has uh, discovered a compound that was licensed uh, by a company called Receptos and eventually uh, acquired by Celgene uh, that's in phase three clinical trials for uh, multiple sclerosis. And this drug should be launched and available in, in uh, probably 2018. Um, and it provides a incredible uh, safety margin over the current therapies uh, with equal or better efficacy than what's available currently. So we're excited about that. Thank you. Oh, one point on that, the molecule that originated uh, for this program came from the Scripps Florida Screening Center uh, back in probably uh, 2008, so four years after we initiated the campus here, we were generating uh, research information that led towards this discovery. And this is another problem with the NIH model. Their investments are not involved in long-term outcomes, right? They want to give you money, you want to do research. Developing new therapies takes time, so you have to invest in the basic research, but then you have to invest in the clinical research, and then you have to invest in the uh, uh, actual marketing of these things to bring, bring these therapies to uh, patients. So it requires uh, a long-term commitment to the process. Okay, thanks. Uh, what are the latest opportunities available for a person to reach a stage four with bone cancer? It's been told it's almost over. We're getting close to it. I don't know if we have um, the right expertise. Joe, do you want to have a microphone? Yeah, we don't, amongst us right now, we don't have a, a group to, you know, we don't, we could only speak in general, general terms um, with respect to bone cancer. So I'm not really comfortable doing that. We, we like to be very transparent about where our expertise lies and where it doesn't. But we can certainly connect you to other people at Scripps um, who you can talk to. We have a question here. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, I just wondered if you could uh, comment on the economic and cultural uh, impact of, say, the Scripps in Torrey Ponds. Uh, we're all used to thinking of universities like Harvard, Stanford, Berkeley, and the huge impact they have in really creating those centers of excellence in those communities and driving the economy. We're also used to thinking of places like MIT, Xerox Park, uh, SRI out in California that were formed in order to create an industrial base and create jobs. Scripps, I understand, is a different animal. It's pure research, pure discovery. But if you look at the example of Torrey Pines, Surely Scripps has had a big impact on the life of that community, San Diego, La Jolla, et cetera. And I wonder if you could just describe, even if they're not creating immediately companies and jobs, how that's affected towards economies. Thanks for that question. Um, what I'd like to have sent to you, uh, so if you come down and give your name here, is uh, just a few weeks ago. So, uh, you know, I, I'm an incredible expert, right, because I've been president of Scripps since December 1. So I really know everything. And, um, uh, but, you know, there is a publication just released by the San Diego Economic Development Board. And because I know the mayor, um, uh, he invited me to it when he heard I was incoming to Scripps. So we just had a sort of a launch of this study that was done. And I'd like to give you that copy of that study because it's quite relevant to Scripps, Florida. And what that study says is that the research and development cluster of um, the, the Torrey Pines Mesa in San Diego adds in its entirety of direct and indirect job generation 14.4 billion a year into the San Diego economy. And that is exactly equivalent to the 14 billion a year that San Diego makes from every kind of tourism, whether it's SeaWorld, um, the zoo, etc. So the overall picture is one of huge economic impact, huge. 
the private research institutes, which in, of which Scripps is by far the premier one. There are these other ones that are on the edges, but let's not worry about that. Um, we're the biggest. We have by far the, the greatest reputation, the deepest scientific impact. By f we have more than a thousand patents. Um, we have more than 50 spin-out companies. Uh, we have invented drugs like Humira for rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, you've already heard what Pat's talked about, about a drug that's coming for MS. Uh, we've invented drugs for leukemia and, and several other kinds of diseases. So the private research institutes in San Diego, headed by Scripps Research Institute, but like I said, don't think of it as Scripps Discovery Institute. Um, they contribute about $4.5 billion a year to the San Diego economy with direct and indirect job impacts. But you have to remember that that's a cluster that's 50 years old. Okay, it's, uh, remember how long ago Ellen Browning Scripps, this amazing woman, had her vision? Um, it, there is just no other way to tell you that it takes time to build a cluster of that density and that magnitude. It takes time. But what you must start off with is excellent research base. And that's exactly what we're doing here in Palm Beach County. Will it take 50 years? I hope not. I hope that we can have a much faster impact than that. And of course, it also has taken investments over and over again from the state and the local community. So there is no doubt that these types of clusters not only deliver the vision and excitement of new medicines and the local economic impact, um, you know, they, they also create the culture of a knowledge base, of a knowledge-based economy, and that's a very exciting place to grow up in and to be a part of. So at Scripps, we're very committed to having our role in that vision. And our role in that vision is to create the most excellent discovery institute that could possibly be. And we're well on our way to doing that. I'm incredibly proud of what these guys have done in 11 years. So I hope that gives you an idea of the validated impact that private research institutes can have outside of the Harvards and the Stanfords. Um, it could be substantial. Let's take one more, one more question. Yeah, we're gonna run, and what we're going to do is one last question, then scientists will do anything for a free drink. So I think that after this last question, we're going to ask everybody to retire back to the bar and please engage these, these people. Please ask them those tough questions that you have. Final question. Can you help clarify the relationship with the major drug companies with respect to research? Do they view you as an active resource or in some ways as competition? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, yeah, I, um, I, I can start. Yeah, I think, let's talk to a couple of people who've worked in both environments. Just a few minutes, though, and then we're done. Sure. So when I was at Merck, uh, we often collaborated with universities uh, because they were uh, had scientists that were experts in their area of research. And since I've been at Scripps, I've had active collaborations with about four different pharmaceutical companies. One of those has continued on for the last eight years. So uh, they don't view us as competition at all. They view us as collaborators and actually enablers of their own uh, internal research. So look, it's getting late. You had a lot of questions. I'd love to see these questions continue. Let's thank again the Civic Association. Let's thank again all of these gentlemen.